You won't recognize if someone is an identical twin by his looks. This unrecognizability, though, is on hand in spite of identical twins having gone through a most fundamental biological process which others have never experienced. After haploid germ cells of the parents have united into the diploid genome of a new being, they basically have additionally been copied from such a new being's diploid genome in the same way in which primitive species like algae have propagated already billions of years ago. Such a basic variability in the mechanisms bringing about people who superficially look all but alike must suggest one thing, that the mechanism is not at the very core of the production of the body. Rather, the body, it would seem, has the ability to use various processes to bring about a crystallization of itself, that is, a crystallization of something the existence and characteristics of which would be predetermined on some other level. In 1921 Prague, the writer Max Brod observed about his colleague Gerhard Hauptmann the similarity of his head to the one of the old Goethe appears as so natural, so plausible, that you hardly are tempted to explicitly stress it. Only much later, when you do not feel the gaze of the clear blue eyes anymore, you become aware of this strange natural phenomenon. You feel that in the end there indeed might be something odd here. Goethe and Hauptmann have had exactly identical ears and facial profiles, but even this would not yet have to appear as a proof of whatever sort of reincarnation. It simply could mean that people with similar ears use it to have children with each other, that certain patterns of how parental genes can combine into a new genome produce time and again, similar ears and facial profiles, and or that people with certain sorts of ears and facial profiles use it to become popular writers. The problem just is that such samenesses continue wherever you become able to view other parts of the bodies of the affected individuals just like they also continue in all facets of the behavior. Rubens, Goethe and Hauptmann have had handwritings of a particular longish, slender, ostentatiously elegant makeup. Goethe's wife Christiane Nevolpius has looked exactly like Ida Wüst, an actress playing major roles in dramas of Hauptmann during a similar phase of Hauptmann's life like that within which Christiane von Goethe has emerged in the latter's life. In the later phases of the lives of both Goethe and Hauptmann, a young adorer with a noteworthy proficiency in the field of writing has emerged who has become an aid of the older poet. Like with Goethe and Gerhard Hauptmann themselves, and with Christiane Volpius and Ida Wüst, you also, with these two younger writers, have to notice a marked similarity of the names. They run Johann Peter Eckermann and Erhard Kestner, and the bearers of these names, again, have shared in striking and unusual characteristics of their looks. 
twin studies already since decades have established that genes largely determine uh, with people of what names we get into closer relations. Given this, one could also still try to explain the similarity between the entire trios Goethe, Christiane Eckermann and Hauptmann Ida Wüst, Erhard Kestner without resorting to an assumption basically beyond ordinary genetics. And yet, continuing to look for additions to the parallel connecting these two trios, you will find equivalent matches which, in a network always remaining the same, fill the entire world of man. Mankind becomes a scenery which again and again is in an utterly similar way, divided into sub-spheres like the ones of those trios. All of mankind, hence, from somewhere again and again, takes a plan on how to divide, on how to organize the activities of every single one of its members. This can be recognized when you screen the leading other representatives of painting and poetizing of the eras of Rubens, Goethe and Hauptmann. Heinrich von Kleist and Hugo von Hofmannsthal are just as accurate copies of Rembrandt Harmenson von Rein as Hauptmann is one of Goethe. Another such example is Arthur Schnitzler. Just like his name could suggest it, he has looked utterly like Friedrich Schiller. He also has developed a similarly insistent, most effective dramaturgy like Schiller, remorselessly forcing his readers and spectators to visualize the absurdity in the actions of his figures by showing that absurdity again and again. Cases like the one of the Virginia Tai hypnotized by Maury Bernstein suggest that if people do not really just become ghosts after their death and subsequently use it to be reborn, there at least will be transferred some of the experiences of earlier figures in such series of people with similar qualities into deep layers of the consciousnesses of later figures in such roles. For Mrs. Tai saw herself as a 19th century woman called Bridey Murphy in Cork, Ireland, herself living in Colorado. The acoustics of the name Colorado, of course, utterly resemble the ones of Cork, Ireland. Moreover, there at least also is a strong similarity between the name Maury Bernstein of Mrs. Tice Hypnotizer and Bridie Murphy. These matches make me fairly confident that if biometric data on the body of the woman here denoted as Bridie Murphy could have been obtained, it would have revealed the same degree of similarity to the body of Mrs. Tai, like you find it connecting Goethe to Hauptmann, Schiller to Schnitzler, and uh, Rembrandt both to Kleist and Hoffmannsthal. On such a basis, then, it would appear to just still constitute a matter of definition, if you think that you have to call such a process reincarnation.